Hey, this is Brent Jensen. You're listening to No Sleep Till Sudbury, the show where we talk about the music that makes your skin vibrate. And today I'm joined by my new pal, Chum FM morning show producer, Mr. Tom Jokic. Tom, how you doing, man? I'm good, Brent. How are you? Good. Thank you, sir. I'm doing very well. I really enjoyed I loved the last episode with the crazy conspiracy theories. I'm still shaking my head at them. And like you, I feel like those conspiracy theories are just too crazy to believe or they're just too messed up but they're so much fun to listen to it was great yeah well thank you i appreciate that yeah. i i i was thinking after it was done that i maybe shouldn't have put my position you know at the end of the show just because i you know i didn't want to sway people and maybe i should just kind of uh, have a little bit more journalistic integrity and just kind of promote the facts as they are but Oh, no, I think you did it really well. No, I love that. I love that because, I, you know, part of the show is your personality. And so when you put, when you put your stamp of, of your personality on something, I think that's, uh, you know, that, that what your listeners want to hear. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Are you uh, taking clients as an agent? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know me. Like anytime you put out a show, I always kind of like tweet or uh, write on Facebook what I like about it because I do, first of all, I believe in supporting other podcasts mm -hmm. um, and other, you know, fellow music lovers. But I also want to tell people like what's great about something, you know, whether we're talking about the five songs that make my skin vibrate or my five favorite podcasts, I will always have an opinion. It's usually a pretty enthusiastic one. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that. You know, I, I think that you and I see things exactly the same way. And that's why on yeah. that, that uh, last episode, I, you know, wanted to give you a bit of a shout out. Um, sure. I'm not a big, you know, ads guy, you know, I want to keep things organic and, uh, you know, just very kind of loose, but, yeah. um, I felt the need to talk about your podcast, which we're going to get to in a second, because, sure. uh, I, I also think it's great being out here. I like to support my peers. When I see somebody doing a really great job, I want to call that out. You know, if, if that helps them out, then that's fantastic. I appreciate what you've done for me too. Thank you. Honestly, like even, you know, your friends that are listening and my friends that are listening, you know, you just want to remind people that even if you don't listen to every single episode, that when you do listen to it, like let people know that you've done that, including people on social media, because it really helps us. And also reminds us that we're not just talking into thin air like we can see the numbers of people that are listening to us but sometimes we want to know just how you feel if you're into it right that's right very much agree yeah now tom you and i were introduced recently by a mutual friend because of the work that we do as um very powerful music mogul type figures <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, we ended up having a, a really great uh, initial conversations very lengthy and we we, yeah. we had a lot in common so it was really cool to meet in addition to hosting the Marilyn Dennis and Jamal Morning Show on Chama you, you've got a lot of decades of experience interviewing musicians and actors and, and artists on air yeah you've actually told me some really cool stories about interviews that you've done with people like Don Henley and so forth well you know I I mean i been in this business for i've been at chum doing the producing the chum morning show for about uh, 34 years now mm. and i've been away for a few uh, just a few recent months lately to deal with some health issues but generally speaking i'm fine so so i still count that all in the 35 years but in that 35 years you know i started out as the morning show producer and sometimes just basically as an as an engineer mm -hmm. but then i you know they could see my enthusiasm and they could see you know that i had i suppose skills in certain areas but every once in a while they'd say hey tom we don't have anybody to interview let's say the philosopher kings right canadian band that had kind of a mid-level success in canada so they say why don't you interview that so i do i start out with smaller bands bands that i like but smaller bands and then a few years later in, in early 2000 2001 they were flying me out to like LA to interview Don Henley. Wow. So I fly out by myself and I have 40 minutes with Don Henley. Well, most of the time you have interviews that, that go for what, 10, 12 minutes. Right. So having 40 minutes with one of my absolute heroes of, you know, songwriting and performing was a thrill. So I wrote a whole bunch of questions and I'm honest to God, Brent, I am three questions into the interview mm -hmm. and he's already taken 25 of those 40 minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs> So I go, oh man, I am screwed, right? There's no way because <laughs> he's going on. Like I need, I don't need bite size. I don't need 10 second clips, but I really would rather have maybe 
a minute, minute and a half answers. And he's giving me like six minute answers. Wow. But anyway, at 45 minutes in, the record company person sticks her head and says, says, Don, Don, we need to wrap this up. And I look at him with my eyes like, why? Because he knows that I still have a lot of questions. And he looks at the record company person. And I swear, Brent, he looked at the guy and said, no, I'm going to need another 15 minutes with my friend Tom here. No way. So I'm in my, <laughs> I'm in my glory. And, uh, and so that was a great, like a great moment. And the resulting interview was really good. You know, another person who I interviewed was so magnetic and so interesting that by the time it was over, I felt like I was her best friend. And that was Alanis Morissette. Oh, wow. And that was in the early 2000s, probably 2002, 2003. And I chatted with her. And by the end of it, she, she said to me, that was really great. Like, and I think she was relieved because sometimes she has to answer the same questions over and over is you ought to know really about Dave Coulier, you know, yeah. the answer probably I think is yes. But anyway, like all that kind of the same old, same old, and why are you so angry and that kind of garbage. And she's very Zen and she also is, you know, almost got a hippie ish vibe about her. So sometimes she kind of drifts off with her answers, but when it came right down to it, she is so into the conversation that when it's over, you feel like you have a connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. That's happened to me a couple of times as well, and it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, Tom, this is a perfect segue into the podcast of yours that we were talking about earlier that you do with Much Music alumni Christopher Ward called Famous Lost Words. So the two of you go through archived interviews with people like the Kinks, Phil Collins, J-Lo, Mick Jagger, all, all sorts of people, and these interviews are from the vaults and haven't been heard since they originally aired years ago. This is really cool to listen to. Right. Well, you know what? We are so lucky. You know, and Chum encapsulates a few different entities. First of all, there's 1050 Chum, the legendary uh, AM radio station in Toronto mm -hmm. that was kind of in their heyday from the late 50s through the, let's say, mid 80s. And it was around that time that Chum FM became kind of the juggernaut that Chum AM was and basically is still you know, one of the big players in Canadian radio to this day. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that when people come to Canada, they are going to drop by Toronto for sure. And they're going to drop by the biggest radio station. So we have everybody like, like there was a day in 2010 where Prince gave us a call on the morning show. That's stunning. Like how many radio stations and how many people do you know who've interviewed Prince? Right. Well, we did. And we put that on our famous lost words podcast. And we have David Bowie, interviews and and john lennon and tina turner and boy george like we go the, we do the 80s as well and the 70s and the 90s and, and we do have access to a little bit of um the much music uh library there's george strombolopoulos talking to the food fighters and people are going full-on berserk so we've got one of those in one of our episodes and we've done about 70 episodes and it's so much fun to dig up the archived interview clips but it's also really fun for Christopher and I to talk about those artists, either what we know or what we don't know. And I hit him with some cool song facts every once in a while and we just riff on it. And it's, it's kind of like what you do in the, in, in the way you talk about music. And so that's one of the reasons why I started listening to your show um, because it was recommended to me. And then once that was the gateway for me listening to it the first time, but you know, you're the reason why I listen ever since then when I want to hear what you have to say about certain artists. And I think our audience wants to hear what Christopher and I, how we want to riff off of, you know, the bands that we mutually love, like the stones and the kinks and, you know, rush and whatever. Yeah. And I love to piss him off if, you, if I can use that phrase with bands like Kiss who I absolutely love and he has no conception as to why as to how a guy who has some good taste in music actually loves Kiss and that's that's one of our that actually that episode's coming up in the next two or three weeks where we got interviews with Gene Simmons from the 70s 76 and 79 and an interview long form interview with Paul Stanley on our morning show from 1999 when he was there to talk about Phantom of the Opera. Oh, but nice. The rest of the interview is fantastic. We've run a, a few uh, Kiss episodes before with me talking with Paul uh, from 99, just me and him. So yeah, I'm, I'm either in the room where it happens, uh, you know, from that famous line from Hamilton, or I'm actually doing the interviews in some of them. But there's so many to choose from. It is an absolutely monstrous archive mm -hmm. of great interviews. 
Yeah, I'll be listening to that. You know, I'm a, a big Kiss fan, so I'll definitely be listening to that <laughs> one too. So that's that's what got me from. Uh, I think it was page one of your book, buddy, and I went, <laughs> "Oh, I know what this guy's talking about here." Uh, we speak the same language, Tom. That's right. That's right. All right, so let's get into your tunes here. You're going to start here with Bob Dylan and like a Rolling <laughs> Stone. You know, it's funny. That song was um, released in 1965, so I was only three years old when it came out. Mm-hmm. And I'd heard about Bob Dylan, and then I'd heard Bob Dylan. And I went, oh, my God, I can't stand that guy's voice. And then I heard like a Rolling Stone, you know, year after year, every once in a while. And, and then it would kind of like every year, Rolling Stone magazine would release a list, and it was always in the top five. And then for the last few surveys it's been number one and probably about 15 years ago i really listened to it or i heard someone talking about it and i listened to it all the way through and i just went okay this could be the greatest song ever recorded in the rock era and so when people ask me what my favorite song is it's i often say it's this and any music fan says when you ask them what their favorite song is they, they'll list you 100 songs yeah. as their number one song of all time it's impossible so, but Like a Rolling Stone is one of those songs that if it comes on the radio and I don't really have time to devote to it, I'll actually turn it off. Mm-hmm. Because when I listen to it, I want to be able to listen to it from beginning to end and just like climb into that song. Now, I almost feel like like I'm climbing in and looking around the studio at the players as they're playing. And I've seen photographs from that day, so I can kind of picture the situation. And then Dylan in this searing vocal, and he's so... He's so pissed off. It's such a cutting lyric about this person or people that he's kind of putting in their place. And it was, and it was original and groundbreaking, even lyrically. And of course it was musically was completely off the wall for him. Like it's a fantastic song that keeps building and building and it's exhausting to almost listen to a the song and Dylan's vocal because even at four and a half minutes in, he lets out this sound like this, oh, and then launches into that last verse. Yeah, and he never lets up, and it's it's just exhilarating. And I remember uh, reading a review by a guy named Greil Marcus, very famous, yeah. you know, uh, critic. Wrote for Playboy. And he said he said he he was in his car, in his, in his mom's car. And she went into a store and that song came on for the first time. And by the time she came back into the car, the song was over. And Greil Marcus said, I don't know if my mom noticed that I had changed as a person from the moment she left the car to when she came back because I'd heard that song. Like it literally changed him. It's such a great observation because it's one of those songs. I played it for a friend a few years ago, basically shut the door in her office and said, you need to listen to this from beginning to end. And at the end, she just kind of whistled and went, oh, my God, like it was Mm. stunning. And it was so much fun to hear someone listen to that song for the first time. So, oh, by the way, if you want a great, you know, behind the scenes view of what it was like to record that song, there's a great book called Backstage Passes and Backstabbing Bastards by Al Cooper. Wow. Played the organ on that song. And his story, he founded Blood, Sweat and Tears Mm -hmm. before David Clayton Thomas and all that. Anyway, that's a great book and almost the full beginning of that book. The entire first two or three chapters are just about recording that song, and it's fantastic. So I wow. recommend that. Cool. Uh, Leonard Cohen with Katie Lang is next, and Hallelujah. So Leonard Cohen recorded this song in 1984 for his uh, album titled Various Positions. Mm-hmm. And Walter Yetnikoff of Leonard Cohen's record company said, What is this? This is not pop music. And I listened to that original version just this morning and went, Yeah, I kind of get that because the original version kind of just it's really weird and it just kind of hangs there. But what happened is when Leonard wrote the song, there was like 80 verses to it. And, and he had to kind of like trim it down. It's funny because my first two songs have a lot in common in that they, they both originally started with like dozens and dozens of verses like mm-hmm. a Rolling Stone and Hallelujah. Anyway, the very first time I really heard the song was Katie Lang singing it at the 2005 Juno Awards stunning and when i went through all my songs this morning before i signed on with you that's the one that truly gave me goosebumps Mm. her performance of that song my favorite leonard version is from his album live in london Mm -hmm. and where it's just a little bit it's just a little bit more form structured as a song whereas the original one was uh was pretty unusual of course it was used in the movie shrek 
by a couple of other artists and then it took off on the you know on the Mer- on the american idols and yeah. all the got talent shows and all that stuff and and even at one point he said you know okay that's enough with the song Leonard. <laughs> but then but then i think he realized what that was doing to his stature and also his pocketbook like he he started really appreciating the value of that song but it's so beautiful and it's so it's something that's religious and sexual at the same time it's like desire and god and mm-hmm. that, and it's just you know prince could pull that off every once in a while he did a song called um i think he did a song well he did a song called the cross but there's another song that he does that marries those two things desire mm-hmm. and religion at the same time and there's something just stunning about that combination if it's done properly and it's rare i mean it's very difficult to pull that off and cohen That's is, is one of right. only a handful of people who can do it i i, I agree with that That's right. That's yeah right. Talk to me about your next pick here, My City of Ruins by Bruce Springsteen. Well, you know, that that song came from The Rising, and he wrote it a few years before that for, I think, his hometown mm-hmm. um, to commemorate how his hometown had kind of fallen into a state of disrepair or ruin. Mm-hmm. And then, but the first time I heard it was right after 9-11. So about 10 days after 9-11, they had a a tribute to heroes or something like that. And Bruce Springsteen was the very first performer on this like telethon. And he did my city of ruins. And it was such a mournful song, especially at the beginning. And it just starts with this, you know, this organ and this plaintive vocal and this, uh, you know, background choir with Patty Scialfa and the rest of the band just, and then it builds into this, this call to rise up. You know, that, just recently, one of the conventions, the national conventions, they used the song The Rising mm-hmm. to indicate how you know Americans were rising up. And the same phrase is in the song My City of Ruins. And it's so uplifting and it's so sad but hopeful. And it just gives me goose it gives me goosebumps even now to describe the song. Mm. Um, but it's just a beautiful song to listen to, and there's a few versions of it that I would recommend. One from the album The Rising, which is a studio version, and then the, uh, the tribute to Heroes is just amazing. And of course, if you see the video of that, it's just like heartfelt. And it's something that North Americans and the, the world needed at a time when they didn't know what to make of their of the tragedy that had happened on the home soil and then how it was how it needed to be turned around into a kind of a call for hope and to rise up for our own society you know it was just great i love that this song this record in particular has popped up on the show a number of times over the 170 oh. plus episodes i've done now yeah, uh, a, lot yeah. Of, a lot of people have, have described it in that same way you know the importance of of needing this song in in, uh, in a very particularly tough time so yeah interesting that it continues to pop up every now and again yeah. well speaking speaking of you know people who have mentioned songs before one of my songs was going to be i can't make you love me by bonnie ray <laughs> but that guy kim mitchell he described it so well that i went well i'm not going to choose that now and by the way i interviewed kim about a year ago yeah. and so i was just thrilled to hear your interview with him very recently and to see that he's still got that great sense of humor and i love him so much and so but still kim come on that was my <laughs> <laughs> you should write him a letter tom yeah sure <laughs> <laughs> talking heads is next once in a lifetime love this well, you know talking heads remain in light album is to me one of one of the absolute best albums of that era came out in 1980 and it's all these uh, like african polyrhythms and the synthesizer that didn't sound cheap it didn't sound like plinky like the early depeche mode you know dreaming of you kind Mm -hmm. of sound which i like i like that stuff i like depeche mode and i like all that early synth stuff but this was like a synthesizer sound that almost sounded like it was run through marshall amps Mm -hmm. like there was something about about at the very beginning, even the opening note just got this primal grunt at the beginning. And it's just done by by instruments. And at the very end, it sounds like guitar solo at the end, when I know it's just a guy kind of leaning heavily onto his keyboards and his synthesizers. And I think Robert Palmer may have played keyboards on that album as well. Musically, it's great. Lyrically, it's fantastic. It's really funny, but it's also kind of connects this um, this disconnect that people have from their lives sometimes where they find themselves in a beautiful house with a beautiful wife and then saying, 
well, how did I get here? Yeah. Right? Like, it's kind of like standing, like, it literally is what it says it's about in the lyrics. You can hear it, and it's really funny, but it's also, you can hear the kind of the shock and horror of the person who says, like, if this is, is this my life? And I love that song on so many different ways, so many different levels. And he performed that song recently on SNL mm -hmm. with his cast from American Utopia, which is his Broadway play. And it it was almost better than the original. I was just stunned. And I, I downloaded that particular performance and just cranked it on the big speakers I have here at home. I, I can't believe that 40 years later, it still sounds that good. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big Talking Heads fan. I, I listen to them quite a bit. They're a yeah. go-to for me. Yeah, that's a it's, it's a great song. All right, you're finishing strong here, Tommy, with <laughs> Kiss, D Detroit Rock City. Let's hear it. Well, you know, my older brother John was a big influence on my music with his albums, and mm -hmm. I don't remember it being a huge collection, but mostly I remember it being the Beatles. And so, and the first album that I really knew back to front was Let It Be, which. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of ironic because in some quarters that's considered the Beatles' worst album. But I loved it, and I loved getting into it and all that. But when I heard when I heard Kiss for the first time, and it's funny, I heard them before I saw them. And I heard Shout It Out Loud. That's the first one I remember hearing, and I went, oh, my God, that's so powerful. Like, it was a great pop song, but it was done as a hard rock song. Mm -hmm. And I just... I loved it so much. I was, you know, 14 at the time. And they were the first band that I called my own. You know, my older brother certainly didn't like them. My dad didn't like them. You know, he had no idea what the hell I was doing. Yeah. And I'm sure everybody was a little bit confused when I had all four walls and my ceiling covered in Kiss posters. Mm. It just it just became my band. You know, to me, it, there's no doubt about it but their greatest song is detroit rock city it's just so powerful it's so well done it tells a bit of a story although it's a it's a bit of a horrifying one it's about a kid who dies in a head-on collision basically driving to a kiss show and, but even the tragedy of that gave it some sort of depth you know and those dueling guitars at the end it sounds like it sounds like the soundtrack for like a mad max movie that like it's epic yeah. and it's and it was it was a new sound for them. It was a bigger sound, you know. Thanks very much to Bob Ezrin, uh, Bob Ezrin and his influence. But that whole album, the whole Destroyer album, with Flaming Youth, you know, mm. my parents think I'm crazy and they yeah. hate the things I do. That just totally spoke to me. And but the songs were just catchy, and they were they were you know aggressive and hard rock, you know. And as a 14 year old boy growing up, I just went, ah, I just love this stuff, and I wanted to. You know, Ace was my favorite guy, even though it was years later when I realized that he didn't even play a lot of the leads, <laughs> the lead record, guitar right? uh, solos on that record, which just shocked me and was, you know, kind of sad and, and that he had to be taught those parts. But, you know, he was still a guitar god, in my opinion. But there's so much to that song. There's so much to that album. And ironically, after they recorded that album, they had such major regrets because their hardcore original fans thought they had sold out and so for a few for several months they actually hated their own album even mm. though the moment they finished recording it they know they knew they had done something special wow yeah that is uh it, it was a huge change in direction for them obviously yes. with bob stepping in but it was it was a weird time because they put out those first three records and hadn't really done well then kiss alive kind of you know lifted them right up and then it, it was a very critical time and they made that yes. decision to go with Bob and really kind of go over the top. And, you know, some of the songs didn't really jive with Kiss fans. I mean, like, I, I focused on the ones that you did, Flaming Youth, King of the Nighttime World, Detroit Rock yes. City. Yes. You know, I, that was kind of the um, the ethos that I focused on. And the other stuff, you know, I kind yeah, of just... Yeah, Great Expectations was kind of stupid. <laughs> like, part of it I like. Part of the build of it I like. I like Do You Love Me as well. That was good. And Beth was fine, but like, you know, like Beth wouldn't even be in my top 100 Kiss songs. No, right? no. And, but it, it was fine. And I was glad, honestly, I was, I was cheering for them. So I'm glad they had a hit. I'm glad they ended up on that Paul Lind Halloween special. It, like I was just thrilled that they were out there and they were becoming more popular because I love them so much. I want them to become popular. Um, but yeah, you know, there was, there was some points where they kind of diverged and of course they changed you know, from album to album to the point where they were releasing a, an album like Unmasked and you're kind of going, guys, like, 
like what's going on here? Yeah. Well, I think after Love Gun, they kind of really lost the plot. That's I think, I think you're right. I liked a couple of songs on Dynasty. And yes, I hate to admit it, but I really liked I Was Made for Loving You. But I know, I know. <laughs> well, you know, you, you got to pick and choose, right? They they gave you so many options and they gave you so much stuff that, yeah. you know, I, at the end of the day, I think I just go through those records and some of it you like, some of it you don't. Yeah. And there are songs right. that, you know, I've, I've written about some of their songs. They sure know something surprisingly uh, kind of grabs you. Great Expectations. It really does. Yeah. I agree. Going back to Great Expectations, you know, it's kind of a weak song on the face of yeah. it. I used to kind of imagine as a, I think I was eight or nine, that Gene Simmons was kind of like sending me a message through that song, wow. you know? And I, I you know. That is cool. Well, funny story. Like I actually met him at a book signing a long time ago, uh-huh. like way before I was doing any of this. And I told him, uh, I referenced that lyric and <laughs> he didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you had no idea. I guess That's it was so you know, funny. It's a throwaway song, but I just thought it was funny that he kind of looked at me like I had five heads, like, what? Well, you know, it is funny because, you know, I had kind of a similar experience with Dennis the Young. I wasn't a huge, huge Six fan, but there was a couple albums that I loved. And I loved the album Equinox and a song co- on it called Born for Adventure. Mm-hmm. So Dennis comes in um, onto the morning show and performs a whole bunch of songs on keyboard alone, and he's astonishing. And he's funny. He's got a bit of a a Vegas thing about him, where his jokes are kind of corny. Mm. But he's but he was great. He was really friendly. He was great. I got him to sign my copy of Equinox, and I said, Dennis, I just love the song "Born for Adventure." Like that. Like it's so powerful and it's got so much energy. And I just love the story. And he looked at me blankly. He said, "Yeah, was that about a pirate or something?" Mm. Wow. (laughs) Like he wrote the damn song. And he didn't even really remember it, right? So yeah. it, it is funny how these things are, we put so much importance into things that are sometimes just a passing fad or a passing thought for an artist, but because they're preserved either you know, on a canvas or, or on a tape, then we get to enjoy them over and over again while they just kind of laid it down at the time and then forgot, forgot about it, especially if it wasn't a hit and they didn't play it at concert. Yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Tom, that is your list, my friend. Well done. Well, thanks. It's uh, been a real pleasure. And, um, oh, hey, can we talk about the, sin- the song that makes my skin crawl? We can. We, <laughs> we can. It's, uh, I believe it's uh, Starship, We Built This City, oh, is it not? Yeah, it sure is. And it's just one of the songs. It's my least favorite song in the history of music. And there's so many reasons for it. But one of them is for a band with such a an important history as in the jefferson airplane to evolve into something that did such a trite and meaningless song as we (laughs) built this city was just shocking to me and i hate everything that song stands for including this faux waving the flag for rock and roll and it almost corporate rock and roll when originally that band was the was the antithesis of what they had become and I was I, like, I hate him. And I like Mickey Thomas as a singer. Yeah. You know, I liked him singing. I fooled around and fell in love. And I liked, um, I even like uh, Jane by Starship. Mm-hmm. Starship. Oh, but, me too. Yeah. But man, that song is just the worst. And I can go on forever, <laughs> but I know we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Way to finish my on kid, a negative. <laughs> my, my kids, my kids have already told me that dad. At your funeral, we're playing that song just to piss you oh, off. Oh, <laughs> that's terrible. That's awful. I know, it's kind of funny, though. It's just funny because they know how much I hate it, and they know that I would laugh at them playing that. If that ever, you know, when that day comes, they're going to play it, and it will be, uh, I'll be laughing and cringing at the same time. Tom, you know what? I'll I'll run in with a boombox, and I'll crank Detroit Rock City, and I'll drown that's them That's the way to do it. How about that? <laughs> if I'm still around, I'll do it. I promise. Uh, all right, my man. All right. Tom Jokic, thank you so much. I appreciate you my doing pleasure. this. All right. All right. Take care, Brent. You too. This has been No Sleep Till Sudbury with Brent Jensen and my very special guest, Mr. Tom Jokic. Till next time, folks. Take good care. Brent Jensen is the best selling author of No Sleep Till Sudbury, Leftover People, and All My Favorite People Are Broken. All titles available in stores and on Amazon Worldwide.